Haiti itself has really been a groundbreaking and icebreaking country, we could say. It is the icebreaker of history. Many of you know it was the first and last successful slave revolution in history, but it has uh, many other honors. Um, Haiti was, in many ways, the first neo-colony. Really, that's what Haiti was from 1801 to 1803. Um, Toussaint Louverture, who um, led a large part of the 13-year Haitian Revolution from 1791 to 1804, uh, really had never conceived of the colony of Saint-Domingue, as Haiti was called, as a French colony, um, as an independent country. He saw it as a part of France, but he said, we, the uh, indigenous population of this nation, can better run the colony than you people can, and let us do it. It was a formula which um, later became known as neocolonialism, uh, carried out by um, um, uh, puppets in, in other countries, but Toussaint really was coming with this in the age of colonialism. He was way ahead of his time, and Napoleon would have none of it. He uh, sent an expeditionary force of um, 50,000 troops. Um, in fact, it wasn't just French. There were Dutch and Germans and uh, a lot of European. It was, in fact, the United Nations of the day came and attempted to uh, re-establish slavery in the colony, retake it. Uh, they kidnapped Toussaint. He was sent to a uh, prison in the uh, south of France and uh, where he died. And um, that was when the revolution went to its next level and became uh, the uh, independent nation of Haiti, which was the original Arawak Indian name of the country, it means mountainous country. Um, Christopher Columbus had called the island Hispaniola in honor of Spain uh, when he saw it, but the name that it now goes by today, the entire island, including the Dominican Republic, which shares the eastern half, is Haiti. So the nation of Haiti was the first country in the Caribbean. It was the touchstone of the revolutions on the continent um, in um, the years immediately following the Haitian Revolution. And actually, um, uh, through two presidents, uh, they received delegations from Miranda and Bolivar, who were working to free the continent from uh, Spanish colonialism. And in fact, it was the guns and boats and printing presses and so support that uh, Petion and Dessalines gave to Miranda and Bolivar that allowed them to carry out the revolutions on the continent. So in many ways, Haiti is the touchstone of liberty in the Americas. It was the first nation, we can say, in the world where all people, not just white men, not just men, but women too, were all equal. And this was... Um, a truly revolutionary, and it's very neglected, this revolution. You, you even will find, just in Cuba, across the way, in the Museum of the Revolution, they have exhibits on the French Revolution, and the Russian Revolution, and the Cuban Revolution, but the Haitian Revolution does not have an exhibit, a uh, real oversight. Um, Haiti also, as I said, it was the icebreak, the pioneer in many ways. It was the first country to have a guerrilla resistance to U.S. Marine uh, interventions, which were happening throughout the uh, hemisphere, the Western Hemisphere, but also in Asia in the, uh, at the turn of the last century. Um, in 1915, U.S. Marines landed, and they were quickly confronted by a um, guerrilla force called the Kakos, and the Kakos uh, fought them for three years. Eventually the Marines managed to um, slip through the uh, guerrilla lines and assassinate the leader of the Kakos, Charlemagne Peralt, and he was, um, uh, they made the mistake of displaying his body on a door to prove that they'd killed him, but 
it, the way they draped a, 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 a cloth on him and put him on the door, he looked very much like a crucified Christ. And um, this image to this day is very dominant in, in Haitian art. And um, uh, so in, in a way they, they, they poured gasoline on the very rebellion they were trying to crush. The Marines occupied the country from 1915 to 1934. It was a uh, very uh, bloody uh, uh, period. There were massacres, peasant massacres. And the uh, uh, population was essentially put back into slavery to build roads, um, which would then serve the U.S. corporations, which were setting up shop there, in particular uh, the Haitian American Sugar Company, uh, the uh, sisal was grown there, a rubber company set up, um, and uh, Haiti uh, then was uh, left in the hands of a thing called the uh, Guard d'Haïti. When the Marines left in 1934, they trained a proxy force to um, uh, look after U.S. interests in the country for uh, the next um, uh, few years until uh, the rise of a, of a country doctor known as uh, Francois Duvalier. He became known as Papa Doc. Um, and uh, he instituted a regime uh, that was um, uh, very bloody, very uh, dictatorial, declared himself president for life and passed that title on to his son, uh, Baby Doc, in uh, 1971, when he died. Um, and Baby Doc's uh, rule continued up through 1986, at which point there was a uh, popular uprising, a rebellion, which ended up uh, sending Duvalier and his wife into exile in Paris. They had a golden exile um, and were able to uh, basically live off the millions of dollars they had plundered from the Haitian treasury. And the U.S. had thought that it could very easily install a, um, a puppet uh, by the name of Marc Bazin. He was a former World Bank um, banker, uh, a technocrat. He came in. Uh, under Duvalier briefly and was shown the door supposedly because he was uh, unable to be corrupted. They used to call him Mr. Clean, but of course he was anything but clean. He was a, he was a total um, uh, filth. puppet, filth. <laughs> and the people knew this and they um, rallied behind a, uh, a priest from the slums, Father Jean Bertrand Aristide, who at the very last minute to the surprise of the U.S. Embassy, declared his candidacy, and in uh, the space of uh, about six weeks, was able to uh, overcome the campaign of Marc Bazin, which had a, uh, a budget of about uh, $36 million. Uh, Aristide had the backing of a progressive uh, a uh, mm -hmm. member of the bourgeoisie who gave him $500,000. So at a uh, 72 to 1 ratio, he was able to trounce uh, Marc Bazin and the other candidates who were in the field. There were about 40. And um, he, they in fact called off the voting when he had 67% of the vote and climbing. Uh, they stopped the count because they didn't want it to go up to 90%, really <laughs> embarrass themselves. Um, and he became president. Well, this was the first great malfunction of U.S. electioneering, engineering in uh, Latin American history. Again, Haiti, the icebreaker, the pioneer, had foiled this, this, this formula that the U.S. was using, which they thought was uh, foolproof. That is, you make an election, you make a contest, and you spend the money for the candidate who's going to win, and you'll win. Well, it didn't work in Haiti. And in fact, people used to go out in front of the streets, I remember it so well, these huge rivers, I mean, rivers of people, thousands and thousands and thousands pouring down the roads. And their song would be, C'est pas la journée, c'est volontaire, oui, which means, 
It's not money. It's voluntarily that I'm here. And this was because all the other candidates would be giving out money to try to bring out their partisans, but they were coming out for Aristide for no money. This was the Lavalas movement. Mm. It was a joyous moment to behold. It was uh, truly one of the great um, uh, optimistic moments of Haitian history. And um, in that inauguration, in, um, 1991, on February 7th, on the palace steps, it was a, a sea of people. All the rivers of Haiti had come together. And uh, Aristide pronounced the second independence of Haiti. It was going to be a, uh, a Haiti which would be sovereign, free, and able to feed itself. It was trying to turn this back. It was really it looked like the consummation of the National Democratic Revolution that had begun really only four years before with Aristide's, with uh, de Devalier's fall. But very quickly the U.S. Embassy went to work with the local ruling classes, um, which has the local ruling classes really two heads, a comprador bourgeoisie, an import-export bourgeoisie, and big landowners it's called the Grandon. And they got together and they made a coup seven months later. About 5,000 people died in that coup, which went from 1991 to 94. And the U.S. eventually had to intervene uh, with Aristide. And the, the popular myth is that they went to restore Aristide and to stop the coup. But that's not really the case. They really came back with Aristide in a cage. Literally, he was in a cage when they brought him back in a little glass booth, supposedly bulletproof. And it was to stop a revolution because the country was rising up. It was the people were not going to take this coup. They were not going to accept it. And um, Aristide got back, and there's a form of resistance that developed in, in um, Haiti. Uh, and it really began in the slave times, and it's called baronage. And, uh, Aristide was really a, um, a, a student of this form of resistance. He was really a student of Toussaint Louverture. This, he was a disciple, we could say, of Toussaint Louverture, who used all sorts of um, trickery and uh, uh, cleverness to play off the various colonial powers against each other, the French against the Spanish against the English. And um, so Aristide came back and he agreed to everything that President, then President Bill Clinton demanded of him. Uh, I'm going to privatize the state industries, I'm going to you know, lower the tariff. But once he got into office, he started to drag his feet, he started to go back. The U.S. Uh, very quickly started to put pressure on him, they killed one of his close aides. He went to the cathedral in November 1995, and he said, I am the president. There's only one Haitian president. I can and I will do what I need to do. And he set loose the people on the country. They went, they collected all the arms caches that the uh, death squads had been using to terrorize people. I mean, it was another mm -hmm. tremendous display of popular power. Mm -hmm. And it was at that point that the U.S. said, this guy has to go. They came in with a guy, this guy, René Preval, who had been one of the members of the bourgeoisie who had more or less put Aristide up to the job at first. And um, he came in and he began, in fact, to institute the plan that Washington had of privatizing. He privatized the flour mill. He privatized the cement factory, where, whose, whose empty shell you saw in this piece by Avi Lewis. Um, and Haiti, I mean, what a tragedy. Here's a country which is made out of cement. It is limestone, 80% of it, uh, which is foundation of cement. And here is a nation now which is going to have to import cement. Uh, uh, an absurdity. It had the largest cement factory in the Caribbean. And now it's important. And this is because of this uh, campaign by international capitalism. And we'll come to that uh, shortly. I'm, again, I'm going very fast, and we can come back to some of these things, but I'm just giving you the, the mountaintops of history. We uh, then had Praval 
come in, but even he could not <laughs> satisfy his, the people in Washington because he held an election and he allowed in this election President Aristide to start to come back for a second time as the Constitution allows two terms for any president. Not consecutive, but two terms. And Aristide was elected in 2000 with even a greater majority, 90% this time of the vote. Um, <clears throat> the U.S. immediately, under Bill Clinton, I remind you, uh, slapped on a, uh, an embargo on Haiti, an aid embargo, which was an, essentially an embargo because the country required massive amounts of aid uh, intravenously to keep it afloat. And um, they began a campaign uh, when George W. Bush came in a few months later in November um, uh, to destabilize the regime. But this time they did it much more uh, painstakingly than they did in 1991. They went about it, they launched a diplomatic offensive, economic embargo as I mentioned, they had um, a political offensive, uh, funding all sorts of groups as they do. Uh, the CIA used to do it, now they do it through a thing called the National Endowment for Democracy, openly, proudly, and then, um, of course, they had Contras. They had these former soldiers, which they set up in the Dominican Republic, funded them, armed them, and sent them across to carry out murderous acts of terrorism and killing. They put the country back and back. Aristide uh, thought he could, again, negotiate his way out. Uh, much like the Sandinistas did in the 1980s, he kept giving concession, concession, trying to appease Washington, but it was not going to work. They finally sent in a team of U.S. Navy SEALs on uh, February 29, 2004, and they kidnapped him from his home with his wife, put him on a plane, and flew him to Africa, where he remains to this day, even though he spent three months in Jamaica, uh, much to the dismay of uh, at one point, Condoleezza Rice even got on the phone to P.J. Patterson, the uh, <coughs> Prime Minister of Jamaica at the time, and said, uh, you know, we are going to cut off everything to the country if you don't get that guy out of there uh, immediately. P.J. Patterson, to his credit, said, I'm going to keep him for a little while, for three months, which they did, but um, eventually he went back to South Africa, where he now is today. President Ray Preval came in in 2006, he was elected by the masses after that coup uh, that went from 2004 to 2006, ran the economy into a rut, and he was expected to bring Aristide back. This is why the base, the masses of people came out uh, and voted in Preval, because they thought that he would be the guy to bring Aristide back. But he, at this point, um, uh, did not. He, in fact, did everything to keep Aristide out and uh, began to work again with the U.S. and France, the backers of the coup, to um, uh, uh, put in place this neoliberal um, crushing of the country. Um, he nonetheless was not able to squelch out this party, which even though it was decapitated, its head was uh, 6,000 miles away in South Africa, and the, the, the body of the party had been largely bought off. Many of the middle-level cadre had been bribed and bullied into joining his party, a party that he called uh, Unité. And uh, he was on his way to holding elections, which essentially would have swept the entire country into the new party he created to destroy the Lavalas party and create his own new party. Uh, and that's when the earthquake hit. So this is where we are now. We've, we've come to this uh, racing re counter-revolution, which was happening, if I can call it that, and it hit this wall. And really, the earthquake was almost like a revolution. If we consider a revolution is to destroy the state, that is what happened. I mean, literally, the government was destroyed. The palace went down, all the ministries fell down, the churches fell down, the UN 
occupation headquarters fell down because I've neglected to mention that the UN troops are still occupying Haiti since 2004 when they came in after the US, French, and Canadian troops handed off the occupation to them. So we end up having a, um, a, an, occupi an occupied country uh, under UN occupation, but the government evaporated overnight, and the people were quite aware of this. And they didn't see it as any coincidence, in fact, that <laughs> all these government buildings fell down. Many of them saw it as a divine sign that God was stepping in. God's revolution. God's revolution. So now we had um, a real problem for the imperialists. They had um, a nation which was in, in, in crisis, and they had to come in. The U.S. immediately sent 20,000 troops to Haiti. But I should not say immediately. It took them a, a few days. The first people to arrive on the scene in Haiti were the Cubans, the Venezuelans, and from halfway around the world, the Chinese. Those were the first three delegations to land. The Cuban doctors were already there. There were uh, some uh, 500 Cuban doctors on the ground. But they sent a medical crew consisting of about 1,500 doctors. These involve about 790 Cuban doctors and 740 international doctors from countries throughout Latin America, Bolivia, Argentina, Panama, Honduras, uh, you <laughs> name it. They're almost all there, plus countries in Africa, Mali, uh, Senegal, uh, Western Sahara, uh, Arab countries, Lebanon, uh, um, Turkey. There were quite a few um, um, uh, uh, field hospitals set up by the Cubans. Many of them were little clinics set up in those big tent cities that you saw, especially in the central square. But they sent them up in Leogan, which is one of the cities nearest the uh, epicenter of the quake, as well as another town, Quad Um uh, But the U.S., seeing that <laughs> there was this South South solidarity suddenly kicking in, immediately sent 20,000 troops, took over the airport. I'm sure many of you heard the stories about how they were, in fact, diverting planes uh, from, for instance, uh, met, uh, Doctors Without Borders, uh, so that uh, their military transports could come in, bringing in uh, loads of weapons. And as one doctor said in the week after, when I arrived there, uh, five days after the quake, he said, we don't need guns, we need gauze. Not guns, but gauze. That was really captured the essence of the irony of that moment. So Haiti is right now in a tremendous battle for which way it's going to go. And it's, it's very complex, and we can maybe go into some of those complexities now, but um, what's happening is that um, the people are trying to put together their coalition to take back uh, political power through elections with their own coalition and reinforce the Lavalas family. But at the same time, uh, the U.S. is looking to put in place its uh, pawns. Uh, in particular, the bourgeoisie has come up with two different fronts for <laughs> national salvation with all their own people already selected and lined up. Um, now, Praval himself he was summoned to Washington last week, as you can see. He met with uh, President Obama. And there's a very interesting dynamic going on now because Praval has suddenly realized, after being a good a bower and scraper for the past few years, that suddenly he realized that that didn't earn him any respect whatsoever, and that um, they were just bypassing him. In fact, out of every dollar that the U.S. was sending in in aid, and they sent about 747 million so far, only one penny of that went to the Haitian government. All the rest went to either the U.S. military, who had deployed their troops, or to uh, NGOs, which were just the uh, 
modern-day missionaries of the uh, empire and uh, the other uh, functionaries of... Uh, Halliburton. Yeah, well, yes. Now, Halliburton, and th this is what... Th these are really... Uh, we have a different kind of football in the United States, but, you know, when the running back gets the ball, you have what you call the pulling guard, who is the guy who runs up in front of him and knocks all the other players out of the way. That's really what the Pentagon is. They're the pulling guard for Halliburton. DynCorp, Brown and Root, these big, they're essentially government operations. They're private, semi-private, but they're the ones who want to come in because this is going to cost billions of dollars to rebuild Haiti. I mean, to rebuild the whole city. It's as if the uh, Klingon mothership had, you know, put down a Tesla beam on the country and, you know, wiped it out. So now you really have a giant reconstruction process to... Um, undertake, and these companies, in particular the U.S., as, as um, uh, you know, we know in Iraq and Afghanistan and uh, all the other wars, they are essentially, the, the, these are the country, these are the companies which in fact fuel the U.S. economy, which is nothing but a war economy. So, um, uh, and of course the Brits get a little piece of the action, I'm sure, in there, and so forth. The crumbs. Uh, yeah, the crumbs. I mean, they have their own spheres. Argentina is, I think, next for them, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so there we have it, and maybe I'll stop there. Uh, we, um, oh yes, no, I just wanted to say this. What is very interesting is apparently Proval, as this piece was pointing out, has not been following the script. And the minute you depart from the script, baton, as they say in Creole, they come with the clubs. And what they're now doing is apparently there's some um, State Department agency which just put out a report and said there's a lot of corruption in the Haitian government. <laughs> well, you know, duh, yeah. throughout Latin America they're all corrupt, but you know you're on the wrong side of the man when they start to call you corrupt, you know. Because, of course, they don't find any corruption in Colombia. Colombia's perfect, you know, but Haiti, you know, it's a problem now. So this means there's some dissatisfaction with... Now, they're not yet calling him a communist, and they're not yet calling him a terrorist, so he's still got a little margin for maneuver. But when they start saying you're corrupt, you know you're getting in a little warm water. So this is... And why are they saying this? Well, two reasons. One... He's saying, as you can see with Bel Reeve, the Prime Minister, they're saying, listen, you know, we have part of the, the, the control here. Let's, let us at least sit in the, by the steering wheel. And, um, you know, this is their first sin, is that they're, they're asking to, uh, to, to, to be the government. And two, um, he is pushing for what Avi Lewis is highlighting in this, national production, what they call in Haiti national production, which means turning so the country can grow its own food instead of uh, just become a cheap labor platform. Very interestingly, the UN has been coming and saying, oh, no, no, we can't get into all that uh, agricultural land struggles. We don't want any of that putting in factories. We're going to do like the Dominican Republic. We're going to have cheap labor, free trade zones where uh, people will work for um, three dollars a day. It's interesting that Praval did his, the U.S. bidding by blocking a bill for a five dollar a day, five dollar a day minimum wage in favor of a three dollar a day minimum wage. But after doing that now uh, they're, they're going after him. Uh, so that's our situation. The, the government is somehow caught in the middle of this huge resistance from below of the people and this big push from uh, U.S. imperialism in particular to uh, really keep its foot more firmly on Haiti's neck. And we have to remember in the global picture that the South in the form of Venezuela, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Ecuador, Uruguay, Paraguay. Now all these countries are coming together. They're 
getting together in fronts. There's a front called the UNISOR, which has formed. The uh, vanguard countries, we could call them, have a front called ALBA. And ALBA has been very, um, I could say, um, uh, active and ready and generous to bring aid. They immediately proposed days after it, 100 million. Uh, UNISOR, the larger uh, uh, front of Latin American nations, includes everybody except U.S. and Canada. The U.S. ambassador said at the time, well, as long as they don't replace the OAS. <laughs> you know, so this is uh, definitely a challenge, and the U.S. knows it. They provide, they've come up with 300 million. So you have um, this tremendous solidarity coming from the South. The U.S. is trying to get back the continent. It is, after all, the U.S. backyard, as uh, Washington sees it. And uh, they've done a coup in Honduras. They election engineered what just happened in Chile. Uh, they're looking to, to, to take it back piece by piece. They're putting seven military bases in Colombia. So Haiti now becomes once again maybe uh, an icebreaker in Latin American history.